are dragons political? Now, it might be that you'd ask yourself such a question playing the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. More likely, you'd ask something like, why is the South Archer build so overpowered? How do these lizard people reproduce? Does it involve eggs? Or is it possible to beat the game entirely by punching? But I think there's some real value to interpreting Skyrim as a political allegory. In fact, I'd argue it's almost gotten more relevant since its release in 2011. So welcome to this video essay on dragons, civil wars, and a sprinkling of philosophy. Onward, of course you must have right at the boys! So if you haven't heard of Skyrim, you can go away. Suffice to say, it's a fantasy RPG with a smattering of dragons. Anyway, to, to help you out, here's a snippet of Skyrim's gameplay. Exemplary stuff, this, yeah, it's a loading screen. Now, this loading screen says, when a dragon uses a breath attack like fire or frost, it is speaking in an ancient and powerful language. A battle between two dragons is actually a deadly verbal debate. This is Skyrim's first injection of political pathos into its dragon lore. Dragons are anthropomorphized in the game. They acquire human characteristics, like talking, dragon blood, and sitting, and being subjected to police brutality. But beyond that, the way they attack, the fantastical dragon breath that's in everything from A Song of Ice and Fire to The Desolation of Smaug is positioned in Skyrim as a particularly violent variant of the average human argument. Dragon breath is not simply an annihilating egress, but a manifestation of the dragon language, in which the player character happens to be fluent. As a dragonborn or human with soul of dragon, the player character enjoys a unique advantage. They are entitled to take part in the deadly verbal debate in a way that is simply not open to the mere mortals that populate the remainder of the game. I tell you, I saw a dragon! But the thing is, there's no practical connotations of this debate in the game's rules. It's not as if, for example, in a rock, paper, scissors, or two chains of competing lightning kind of way, fire overpowers ice. The game's signature shout is <laughs> Force, balance, push. It feels intuitive that the call and response ought to be, they say force, you say balance, counteracting their shout with its opposite number. But it doesn't work like that in game. The game engine treats every shout in a vacuum. Hold on to your sweet rolls, I'm gonna say it. This is a textbook example of ludonarrative dissonance. The game's lore suggests that there's some depth to these dragon debates, where debate signifies an exchange of ideas. But the gameplay has no such exchange component. It's just individual voices shouting into the void. So if we were overthinking this game, we are overthinking this game. We could suggest that Skyrim's writers and developers have presented debate as a construction of personal attacks and non sequiturs, where one person is not actually listening to the other, but merely shouting back at them until they explode into dragon energies and get absorbed by a guy in an ahistorical haunt helmet. Shouting in Skyrim doesn't have a concept of discourse. So if you've seen an Edmund Hyde video before, you know I like to tie these ideas together with a little bit of theory. For that, today we're shooting for the old golden goose, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel and his threefold Hegelian dialectic, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, or abstract, negative, concrete. This was how Hegel described dialectics or discourse as a development of ideas. The flaw in the original idea or abstract needs to be knocked back with its negative, like a puffy proof of bread dough with too much hot air. Only then can the dough go through the oven and come out like a block of concrete. I'm bad at baking. So in debate, what Hegel expects is for an individual to come forth with an idea that needs developing, for other individuals to query and question it, and hence for the idea to become firmer and readier as a result. Hegel didn't see debate as deadly, he saw it as productive. And that's why Hegelian dialectics proved foundational for old Charlie Marx. And his totalizing quote, philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Fast forward 200 odd years and we get to a guy called Jürgen, Jürgen Habermas. Simply put, Habermas was thinking about why exactly society didn't seem to reflect the synthesis of ideas that Hegel had set out. 
I'm not going to quote Habermas head on because the guy is dead verbose. But I've got some good secondary literature. So let's have a flick. Habermas imagined an ideal speech situation as the one where the principles of truth, freedom and justice are realised so as to guarantee a rational consensus. This imagined situation would be blind of rhetoric or dogma, and Habermas figured it would come naturally to participatory civil society because of its underlying presumption of validity invested in the act of intersubjective communication. In other words, in their efforts to make their interests and identities known and recognised, actors make the commonplace assumption that communication with others is possible, that dialectics and discourse can happen in a productive way. So why don't we get this dialectic? Well, Habermas placed the blame squarely at the feet of modern, rationalised, representative democracy. Systems where participation was growing limited and the spectrum of opinion was treated like a kind of political game instead of a means of active discussion. Routinized political parties and interest groups substitute for participatory democracy. So while we tend to think of modern society as giving us additional freedoms, opening new markets, enabling choices, and letting us speak our mind, Habermas suggests that such a society is not as free as it seems. In fact, the mediation of representation allows services such as the mass media to run rampant, more or less replacing the dialectical field of the wider public sphere. Let's run a little thought experiment, then I promise we'll go back to Skyrim. How about you're talking with your friends about the way you think the world is going? If your friends are any good, you'll be looking to comfort each other and look for reasoned judgments about how to muddle your way through the 21st century late capitalist hellscape. Now imagine spending the same amount of time browsing the Daily Mail website to figure out how the world is going. Odds on the latter will probably make you more anxious. It's loaded with value judgments, xenophobia and bigotry in a way your friends probably aren't. But despite this, it carries with it the vast majority of information and discussion about our daily lives. Politics is happening somewhere else. So enough of Habermas and enough of Hegel. How does this play out in Skyrim? Well, beyond the simplification of dragon debate, there's a solid chunk of the story that plays out through Skyrim's ostensibly political civil war. This is a feud between the Imperials, think an EU-like entity looking to maintain peace on the continent, and the Stormcloaks, a nationalist, obscenely patriotic band of merry men that seem equal parts Mel Gibson and Nigel Farage. Both groups tarnish each other with a similarly unrelenting critical brush. The Imperials call the Stormcloaks racist, and the Stormcloaks call the Imperials dictators. Long live the Empire. And both of them carry a grain of truth. The Stormcloaks are definitely a bit racist. They hate anyone who isn't as pale as the snow they walk on. Maybe the reason these Grayskins don't help in the war is because they're Imperial spies. And the Imperials are definitely a bit authoritarian, scuppering Skyrim's autonomy at every turn. There's an easy comparison in contemporary British politics. UKIP and the Brexit party were a bit racist. Bongo, bongo, lad. But the EU was a bit unelected. Hang on, Skyrim isn't contemporary. It was written more than five years before the EU referendum even took place. And it was written by Americans. I think that's dead impressive. In fact, the underlying binary of open-minded global outlook versus closed-minded local outlook has really come of age in the post-Skyrim era. Am I the only one who measures time by pre or post Skyrim? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, yes. In any case, although these two sets of ideas shouldn't necessarily be lumped together, it's possible to be globally minded and critical of globalization, for example. They represent a dichotomy we saw played out at length during Brexit and once again during the US presidential election of 2016. In the context of Skyrim, and in the context of America, these political movements represented the breaking down of old political affiliations in favour of fresh flavoured polarisation. But that's exactly what it was. Polarisation. Two sides facing away from one another, Boom! shouting. Clinton and Trump were doomed to antagonise one another. The Stormcloaks and the Imperials are just the same. Even when they're placed in mutual mortal danger by the literal boss of dragons. That's not to say there's a rational way to engage with Mr. Best Words or a racist dragonborn. There isn't. Because as Habermas says, these polarised sides are exactly what we'd expect from an over-rationalised system to distribute the truth. Habermas put it, as steering problems become more complex, 
irrelevance, misguided regulations, and self-destruction can accumulate. And we see an independence of illegitimate power drawn from outside the political process. For example, lobbying groups or mass media conglomerates. Moreover, in Skyrim and in the real world, changes at the top of society are hardly felt at the bottom. You finish the Civil War questline and some people play musical chairs on Skyrim's individual thrones. I guess you could call it a game. But an imperial victory in the Civil War doesn't stop these guys from being racist, and a Stormcloak victory doesn't make them twice as racist neither. I don't know whether it's because the developers couldn't be bothered to code this, or it just didn't matter to them. Regardless, they recognise that contemporary democracy seems to be continuously muted in its effect on real, lived experience. Okay, in Skyrim there is one exception to this whole politics happens somewhere else shtick. As part of the main storyline of Skyrim, the whole stop dragons destroying everything story, the player is actually asked to resolve the civil war if they haven't already, so they can perform the anthropomorphized dragon torture I mentioned earlier. They have to actually do some politics. But the way Skyrim's writers and developers treat this quest, entitled Season Unending, is powerfully flippant. It progresses as a light talkathon, with the player choosing dialogue options to build a truce. The one problem is this. Skyrim is a god game. It wants to make the player feel like the centre of the universe, no matter what. So the player can act the arch anti ban ki moon, stumbling over platitudes and insulting both sides of the prospective piece, and it'll still work out. The quest must go on. The player's personal ineptitude can't stop the war from resolving. It seems we may have an agreement. Talking politics is a triviality, a box to tick so the main quest can continue. Season unending is really bad, but it also highlights the overarching way that Skyrim paints politics. A way that venerates Habermas and pisses on Hegel. From dragon debates, to shouty oppositions, to perfunctory peace treaties, Skyrim thinks politics is pointless. It can't be relatable and it can't be relevant. It doesn't touch civil society. But political intrigue seems like a good fit for a modern fantasy game, so Skyrim packs it in anyhow. Well, there you are. Examine Skyrim carefully, or overthink it at your own risk, and you realise that it has three things to tell us about politics. Debate has become toxic, polarised and painful. Identity politics has infuriatingly little impact on the challenges of our time, and engagement with all this is still frighteningly optional. I think, at least in terms of the writing, this was probably all a total accident. You see, the systems of Skyrim don't just lean into ludonarrative dissonance, they also experience temporal dissonance. All of your problems can be put off for another day. Quests aren't time limited, they last forever. Because of this, claiming that Skyrim shows us how politics is optional is just as reasonable as saying that it shows us that joining a guild of mages is optional, or saving the world from total apocalypse owing to a calamitous global event brought on by giant lizards is optional. Actually, perhaps that's why politics is pointless in Skyrim, and why dragons decidedly aren't political. Because in this game, there's no concept of haste, no concept of urgency. The problems we face in the real world can't be ignored like a wayward quest marker. We have to face up to our inequalities, our climate crises, and, as Habermas would have it, our flawed democracies. Because within action comes a cost that we simply cannot bear. And in that respect, I suppose the debate is indeed deadly. Mm -hmm.